Okay, so we talked about before creating variables, how we store information in MATLAB, right? But let's go in a little more depth on that. So we in day-to-day -day life, uh, let's say with written communication, we have ways of storing information. Uh, and that's what we are actually communicating between each other, right? Or same for ourselves. So with written, we have things, we have sentences that we use to communicate, right? Sentences. These sentences are composed of words and punctuation. Locus composed sentences. We also have numbers. So like, I could say I have a count of 50 50 apples, right? I'm storing numbers in that. Um, you also have, if you're working in like a chemistry class, you have units, right? That's another thing we're sharing information on. You also have diagrams. That's a way we can communicate. You also have symbols. And symbols, just like in, uh, I'm thinking about like in math, if you have variable x, right? That's a symbol. You can use alpha to represent information. So these are some examples of uh, information we store when we're communicating with each other. Now in MATLAB, we have ways of storing the same type of information. So let's look at uh, our way of thinking. This is us, and this is MATLAB, right? Uh, for us, there's a sentence. In MATLAB, this is called a string. So this is to store like, I went to the store. That sort of information, you store that in a string. It's just a series of characters. Because like how we have words and punctuation, if we break this down, strings are composed of characters in MATLAB. So what does this actually look like if I, if I were to go into MATLAB? Well, if I were to create a variable A and I wanted to store some sentence, like I went to the store. The way I do this is I use the quotation marks and then I have whatever I want to be within the string and then I close with the quotation marks. So you can store all sorts of information in here. Um, these are just letters, but I can store punctuation. So I went to the store, I can add a period there. I can add an exclamation point. Uh, you can also have various um, symbols in there, like dollar, minus, underscore, plus. Those are all stuff that you can hold within uh, a string. You can also have numbers, one, two, three. I can put that inside a string. So I went to the store at three. That's perfectly valid string. So. Within these, I have each of these little characters, we call them. Um, so the I is a single character. If I, if I use a apostrophe or a tick um, and then I, that's a single character. All right, so strings and characters work in similar ways, but characters are effectively with MATLAB, a matrix of characters. So if I had A is one, two, three, the character is one, two, three, then A is now a matrix. What it actually looks like is one, two, and three. And these are all still characters. Whereas with a string, over here, this was just I went to the store at three um, within the matrix. So that's the way these are composed in MATLAB. All right, so that's strings. That's how you're going to store that sort of information. How about numbers? Well, we know how to do numbers, right? However, in MATLAB, it's a little more complicated. So far, we've just been creating a number with something like A equals one, right? However, if I were to do this, MATLAB has a default way of storing numbers. 
but there are several options. So the primary options that you'll care about, I'll go into here. So there's double and single. There's uint and int. Then within these uint and int, 8, 16, 32, 64. And those can store different uh, information. So within MATLAB, the default that it will do is double. So when I just say right here, a equals one, I didn't specify what I wanted. It, it just knows, if I put it to here, it knows two is a number. So it'll automatically default to a double. Um, and if I go into MATLAB right now, I can say a equals two, suppress that, clear, CLC. And if I run this, you can see name is a, value is two, right? We've seen this before. This is pretty simple, uh, but there's an extra bit of information here that we can see by if we click down on the arrow to the right of this workspace and click choose columns and click class. Right there, if we pop up class, you can see double. So this is this is me storing a double class and class is basically the type of information. Like when we were looking at before, that's the string character double. Um, so if I did a is, if I comment this out, a is a string, is a string, run this, value this is a string, the class will be string. So you can see the class is dependent on what information you're storing in it. So right now I'll switch it back to one, run this, and you can see it's a double. So that's perfect. We can, we can make it double. However, in MATLAB, there's ways to make different types of numbers. So double is the one we're probably going to want to deal with, but doing double of one. So using the built-in function double that uh, takes whatever's input to it and makes it a double. That's effectively the same as just doing one because MATLAB will automatically choose double type if you don't specify anything. Uh, the other types are, so we've got double, we've got single, we've got int 8, int 16, int 32, the main ones, uint 8, uint 16, uint 32. So these are the primary numerical classes or data types that we'll be dealing with. So we just saw I can make a double either by just typing in a number or I can say double of one, right? And that will do the same thing. However, if I do a single of one, if you look here, uh, as you can see, when MATLAB ran it, it pops up single. So it's informing me when I run this, if I don't suppress it, it'll say single. That's the data type or the class and then the value of one. And you can see, of course, when I look here to the class, it now says single. The, the different types of data here are all used to store numbers. But uh, as you know from math, integers don't include decimal points, right? If you had uh, g is the acceleration due to gravity of 9.81, then if I were to do a int 8 of 9.81, it will round it to 10 because integers don't house uh, numbers after the decimal point, right? So double and single do. The differences between all these is that this can store the most amount of information. Um, and this takes up space on the computer. So it's, it's costly uh, to choose this option. Single, uh, again, allows for decimal points. So double would be like, whoops, no letters, of course. Lots of numbers, point lots of numbers. Single is uh, lower than double. 
it's only got half the, it, it can only store half the uh, information as double. Int8, Int16, Int32, they're all integers. So again, if I do Int8 of 9.81, right, that's 10. If I do Int8 of negative 9.81, that's negative 10, right? So it just rounds effectively um, up or down to get an integer out of this. The difference between int and uint is u means unsigned. So int is any like number without the decimal points, right? uint is only positives. So if I did, you can see where I did int 8 of 9.81 is 10, int 8 of negative 9.81 is negative 10. If I do uint 8 of negative 9.81, I get zero because it doesn't do negatives. It will just round it up all the way to zero. Um, whereas if I do uint 8 of 9.81, it'll do 10. So it works the same for positive numbers as int 8. It's only with negative numbers that it will round it up to zero. So now what's the difference between 8, 16, 32? Well, the way computers store information is with bytes. So uh, in computers, they really only have two options, right? We've heard of binary, where we as humans, we deal with a base 10 system. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's 10 options here. In the base 2 system, you just have 0 and 1. So if you have 0 and 1, um, in order to store 2, instead of... Uh, Having number two, as you can see, two isn't an option here. So instead of storing it as two, it's one zero. And this isn't 10 because we're not dealing with a base 10 system, we're dealing with base two. And so in binary, zero is still zero, one is still one. But when you get up to two, you now, just as when in math, you get 10 in this column, you bring a one into the next column. That's what we're doing here. We got up to two in this column, so we bring a one into the column to the left of it. And then three is, and that's going to be one, one. And now four is one, one plus one. And now that's one in the left column here and two in the right column. But because we have two in the right column, we bring over a one to this column. But now this is two. So then we bring it to one more column and we have one zero zero as the binary for four. So this is how you deal with uh, a base two system. But in programming, we still want to deal with uh, a base 10 system because that's what we think in. But the eight is how many uh, bits is being stored. So if I pull up the documentation for this, I click Explore MATLAB and I go to Language Fundamentals and Data Types. Here you can see I have numerics and numerics, there's floating point numbers, single precision, integers, and more. So floating point, let's click on this. There's double precision, floating point, and single. So this is floating point or when you have decimal points within your numbers. So if I, if I look here, uh, double and single, the difference between them is the real max and real min. So the highest number you can have for a double is uh, 1.79769 times 10 to the 308. Uh, if you were to do one seven nine seven six nine and then add three hundred and eight minus one two three four five, uh, so three hundred and three zeros after this. That's the biggest number you can have in doubles, which is ginormous, right? But you can also the smallest positive number you can do is times ten to the negative three hundred and eight. So the smallest number you can have is 0 
with 307 zeros and then 222507. That's the smallest number you can have in doubles. That's positive. And then this is the most negative number you can have. This is this this is effectively the increment of how much you can step up. In an integer, you can only go one, then it goes up to two, then three, then four, then five. With doubles, it goes from one, uh, because the increment is here, is the smallest positive double you can have, right? So in a one times that, I can have two times that. And then just as I was going up one, two, three, four, five, uh, with doubles, you go up in increments of this instead of one. So this is the smallest step you can make in a double. And then you have three times that going on. Uh, with singles, you have these. So it's a bigger increment. So instead of this being the smallest increment I can make with singles, it's this. So you can only as 38 or 37 zeros, uh, 0 0.37 zeros, and then 117, so on. So you can as a lot smaller amount of data in doubles, and you can go to really, really high numbers. With single, you can't go as high and you can't do as big of increments. So the reason you'd want to use single instead of double, right? Because double can handle everything that a single can have and more. But the reason to do a single is that it takes up less information in the computer. Like if you have a program and it, you know it only is going to go to 1000, it's a waste for you to store all the extra information to use a double. You could just use a single. Now with the ints, let's look at those. I go to integers. Uh, these are my options. Signed and unsigned. So signed is just the int. Unsigned is uint. And I have 8, 16, 32, and 64. There's another one. It goes up to 64. The function is there. But what we can do is we can go from negative 2 to the power of 7 to 2 to the power of 7. Now, why is this? Well, the amount of possibilities is 8 bits. So what that means is in the base 2 system, it has 8 columns effectively. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I want too many here. Within 8, the highest number that can be stored, 2 to the 8. Uh, and that's because if you only had 2 bits, the highest you could store is 3. Right? And 3 is 2 to the power of 2, which is the number of bits, uh, and then minus 1, because we start at 0. So 2 is because it's the base, and then we got to the power of the number of bits. So if we have a base 2 system, and we have 2 bits, this is how we can calculate the highest number and so I'll get this highest number is base to the power of number of bits whereas if we have a base 10 and let me just show you real quick see it's having an error because i didn't give it a variable it's trying to override a number so comment this out run it again and now the highest number is three for a base two system with two bits you can have three with a base 10 system in two bits, you can have 99, right? Which makes sense because if we're trying to store 100, we can't store that in two columns in a base 10 system. Now, if you have a base two system, so we're looking again at this int eight, uh, and we'll look at u int eight first. So in a base two system, u int eight, so the number of bits is eight. We can store 255. And that is exactly what we look at. If we see unsigned eight bit integer, it's zero to two to the eight minus one, which is our base, which is two, 
to the power of our bits, which is 8, minus 1. All right, so that's how you can calculate what your number is. And the reason why we've got uh, negative 2 to the 7 to 2 to the 7 for a sign is because we have to have this, basically. We're going, um, instead of being able to do 0 to whatever that is, we need to store half of that minus the 0 because uh, we have all the negative numbers and then the 0. So you divide this by 2. Uh, you divide the 2 to the 8 by 2, and you get 2 to the 7, right? So you get negative 2 to the 7, 2, 2 to the 7 minus 1, because they just chose to house one more negative value than one more positive value. Computers like this binary, right? We like our base 10. And in the base 10, it's that, but in the base 2, It's 255, right? So that's that's what this int 8 and 16 and 32, to see how much I can store an int 16, or you int 16, that's the highest number. But again, you can pull up this documentation and that has all this information for you, or you can perform this calculation yourself. Highest number signed is base to the bits divided by 2 minus 1. And so with unsigned, the highest number in a 16 bit is 65,535. Highest number in a signed bit is 32,767. So hopefully that makes sense. Those are the options that we have for storing numbers in MATLAB. You're only going to use an int 8 if you only have storage for int8. But uh, with engineering, we're typically going to be dealing with decimal places. We're going to just default to the double. But now that you're introduced, you sort of have an idea, and hopefully that makes sense why you would use one or the other. So that's doing numbers. In MATLAB, we have a couple other options. So we talked about numbers, strings, and characters. Uh, the next we'll talk about is Booleans. So Boolean only has two options. It's true or it's false. So with MATLAB, the way you do this is you just say A equals true. Or you say A equals false. And this is to form operations. You'll see more of the utility of this in the future. But for right now, this is just another way we can store information. So if we wanted to know if something is uh, the case or not, then we can start with true or false. These are also called logicals. Uh, and the next one is complex. And complex numbers, they're like we see in electrical circuits or whatever you may have seen imaginary numbers in, but you have 1 plus i. This is 1 in the real and 1 in the imaginary. And the way you do something like this in MATLAB is you say a equals complex of 1 and 1. And the left one here is the real, the right one here is the imaginary. So this is where we we're dealing with numbers. Start a new cell, clear CLC. And let's create a Boolean. Uh, let's just call it true. If I run this, you can see it's a logical class logical, uh, also known as Boolean. And B is false. So you can see, we kind of noticed this before, but when, when it thinks something is true in MATLAB, like if I say is var name, I can say highest number. And if I use the space, it automatically assumes it's a string here. So is our name is a valid variable name, right? But the way it showed us this is with the logical one. So you always know when there's a logical one, this is true. When there's a logical zero, like is our name of one, for example. Let's run that again. Just the number one. Will return a logical zero or a false. What about 
complex numbers. So now I'll say A is complex. I'll call this A complex it is complex of one and one, just to match before. Now it's complex is 1.000 uh, plus 1.000i. Now, if you look at the class here, it's a double complex. So just as I stored, if I do a complex equals complex, but let's say you int eight of complex of negative one, one. Now, if we're on this, it's a uint8 type complex. So it's still got the complex element, the real, the imaginary, but with uint8, it's now storing the real and imaginary numbers as unsigned 8 bit integers. So I can go back again and I can say a complex is a double of a complex. And now you can see it returns it to a double. So as you might have noticed here, a complex is zero plus one i. So if I look at i here, it created an ants. I, I, I don't see an i in here. So I'm not sure where this is coming from yet, but it creates the ants with a complex number with zero in the real, one in the imaginary. So this is a complex number, but it's a value of an imaginary singular value. So what we would expect from I, right? In engineering, we often use J to uh, as a placeholder for imaginary uh, instead of I. But in any case, we get I and J return a single value here for value of one in the imaginary, zero in the real. So if I were to say one plus or let's say I say 10 plus three times J, I would be able to then construct a complex just as I was able to use the function complex. I can use I or J to do a real plus an imaginary. So that's how you can store imaginary numbers. Now, what exactly is the reason to use each of these? We'll go into Booleans later. Uh, this is for use in what's called conditionals. But the numbers are obvious. That's just to perform math operations. And for the strings and the characters, it really is a matter of interfacing with us as humans. So we'll have some functions we talk about later that let us type stuff in. And when we just type stuff in, it will uh, input it as a string because it wants to be able to have letters and numbers and plus and minus and all that. So it will allow us to put in stuff, it'll put it in a string. And then if we want to add the that together, then we'll have to make it a number. So another useful thing here uh, is a function called num, and then the number two and then str. And this is short for number to string. And what this does is if I give it a number here, it will return character for that number. So, so this is slightly uh, confusing how it does it, but it's really creating a character instead of a string. But it's creating uh, this number in oops, characters. So these are characters, but it... Uh, converted the numbers to characters. And the reason for that is because there's a function char and that will take in an input and convert it to characters. But if I were to feed in one, it wouldn't convert it to apostrophe one apostrophe like a character would. It converts it to this weird character that won't even show up in the uh, command window. So what this is doing is if I pull up the doc for char, if I can see here, convert integers to characters. Um, if I do 
char of 8451, I get degrees Celsius. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but basically what it's doing is it's storing what, what it really sees when it sees degrees C or what, yeah, when it shows you degrees C, what it's really seeing is 8451. And it's just converting it to a character that makes sense to you. And then the character for one is some different value. So if I were to do double of one, I can see I get 49. So if I were to do char of 49, I get one. So in reality, it's a little bit confusing, but you can use the functions and sort of see how they fit into each other. That's the utility of string to num is to get a string and one, two, three, for example, it then converts it to a double one, two, three. So it lets us deal with the actual conversion here where it's a weird conversion process. So I can also do string to num of characters and it will return the same thing. I can add uint eight of 10 plus uint eight of 15 to each other. And I can get a uint eight of 25, just like expected, right? Because all it's changing is how it's storing this information. It won't change like what addition does. It'll still add just like normal. So that's the uint eight. Um, however, if I were to do uint eight with double, it would be fine. It will again return, when I run this, it returns a 25, right? But the problem comes when I have too high of a number, because when I do a double and a uint eight, it goes with uint eight. As the class it takes for this final, for my answer, this will be a uint eight. And it'll go basically with the smaller of the options. So when I add a uint eight to uint 16, it won't even let me add a uint8 to uint16. As you can see here, using this error, I would have to do a uint8 here in order to add the two, or I can do a double. So uh, the problem here is that it gives me 255 instead of, what this should be, 1,015,000. We'll just go to 255, it'll go to its max value. If I'm going with double, which is the largest thing, then if I'm going above its maximum value, then it just goes, okay, it's so big, I don't know how to deal with it, go to infinity. It's not a new class, it's still a double. It's just telling it that it's beyond the bounds of, of our data type or our class. So when we're just adding numbers together, we'll typically go with double. It's just a matter of, when you're doing programming stuff, if you're worried about memory or worried about speed or whatever, you may need to do uint8 or maybe the hardware limits you to only use uint8. Now, what about the operation? So we know what one plus one does, right? This is a double added to a double because we didn't specify. So it's just one plus one and it'll give us two double class, right? What if I do a string of one plus a string of one? Well, what, what happens when you add strings together is it just puts them next to each other. So if this were a B, it will just add it. It's called appending it. It just puts it at the end of the string. So this is a string, put quotes around it. It will just put all the strings together as one. And if I could do size of ants, it's a one by one because like we said before, strings aren't don't store each of these characters in, in uh, the position in a matrix. They just house all of it, all, the whole string in one. So when I'm done with strings, I'm able to say string one and house it in one spot in the matrix. And then do this is a second string 
and house it in the second spot in the matrix, right? And now it's a one by two string array. So where we have ants is string, but it's a one by two string. And if I double click on it, I can open what it actually is. And that pops up like an Excel spreadsheet and that will pop up with your editor. So you can just close it right here. So when I do this, um, that works. What happens if I add characters together? Well, what happens here is ants returns a double and it's 99. And the reason for that is if I do a double of one and a double of two, I get 49 and 50. So what it's doing is it's converting this to the number it understands is the character one, and the number it understands is the character two and adding them together. So 49 plus 50, we get 99. What if I add a string to a character though? What exactly is that gonna do? Well, what it does when you add stuff to strings is it converts it to a string. So this is saying string of two, and it adds it to that one. So when you add strings, you just put them together. So it does one and then two. If this were A, it would do one A. Uh, and then when I add numbers to this, it also just converts it to a string. So what it does is it will convert, when you're adding stuff to strings, it'll always just convert it to a string and then put it in the string with it, just like adding strings normally does. If I were to add a character to a number, then it will convert this character to a number and then add that to the value of this. So if I were to do double of A, it's got to be 97 because when I add it to 2, it does 99. So double of the character A is indeed 97 because when I add 2 to it, I get 99. So this is fairly nuanced. You're not gonna need to like know the conversion of what the character A actually means in a numerical value. But uh, this, is, this is really important to know because you don't wanna be adding the character one to the number two and thinking you're gonna get out three when you're gonna get out 51. So that's important to know. Uh, how about matrices with multiple values? Well, the way this is going to work is if I try and have a character and then a number in a matrix, what it will do is we'll, we'll convert this to, it'll do char or convert it to a character to, and then put it in a matrix together. And when you have multiple, uh, pair of one char two, what this does is it puts it all into one matrix because this is really char one is equal to C, H, A, and R on one matrix. It just has them each in their own position in the matrix. And so remember that if you're trying to have char one and char two, you got to use a string because you can actually store those in different positions. Whereas this will just do C, first character, second character, third character, fourth character, um, and then add it on forward. But yeah, as you can see, when you got a character and a number, it will just convert the number to a character um, and then put it together in a matrix. If you have a string of one and a character of one, it will convert the character to a string. And if you have a string and a number, it will also convert the number to a string. So when you got strings, it's basically going to convert everything to a string. With characters and numbers, it's a little more complex and you want to delve into the nuances and just be careful when you're dealing with that because it's not going to like it. So as you can see, it doesn't like multiple data types in a matrix. So matrices only allow you to store one thing. Uh, it can be a string, it can be a character, it can be um, whatever type of number. If I say u int 8 of 1, 2, 3, the matrix 1, 2, 3, it will convert it to a, if I go to ants, it's a class u int 8, and it's got the values 
within a matrix of one, two, and three. So this will work just like you and date. Uh, if I were to have a number too high, it would convert to 255, two and three. It'll just treat each of these like their own U and Tate, but put them in a matrix. So if I add a double in this matrix right here, it'll convert that three to a U and Tate because it'll only allow it to all be one data type. So I can have it be a specific numerical value. I can have it be booleans or logicals, true, false, true, 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 false. And when I run this, it's a logical one being true, zero being false, right? And it just makes the array. If I tried to do 100, uh, it will keep it a logical, but it'll do a logical of 100, which is a logical one. So, uh, and as for operations between logicals and doubles, for example, if I do true times 100, it'll be 100. If I do false times 100, it'll be zero. And that's giving me a double because true is one. So if I add the two together, true, this will give me 101, and false will give me one there. So, that's operations between different things. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're done with different data types, uh, making sure you understand how to make them interact with each other properly using num to string where necessary, using double, using string, using character wherever necessary. All right, so that's all about data types for now. Let's delve into the next thing, which is plotting. So plotting is just like you would expect. If I'm doing plotting in MATLAB, it's just like plotting in other things. I'm just doing points on a graph, right? So let's look at a very basic plot. I'm just going to plot one point, and it's going to have an x of 1 and a y of 2. Right. When I run this, whoops, I'll do a clear CLC, run this, it'll pop up a figure, and it looks blank. And the reason for this is because there's a tiny dot right at x of 1, y of 2, right in the center here. It's got a dot. It's just not super visible. As you can see, I can move around, but it doesn't have a super visible thing there. So we can actually use specifier and we use a character to put this in here and we'll just put an X and you can see what this does is it makes it an X instead of a dot. So now I've got an X there. If I use the scroll bar on my mouse, I can zoom in and I can indeed see it's at one, two. So that's how you plot like a single point, but single points aren't super helpful to us. So let's start dealing with more than one stuff. So this is just a specifier to do an X instead. Uh, you can you do an O that will create a circle and so on. We'll go more into detail on that later. That's just so that you can, when you're confused why you're plotting a point and you can't see it, that's why. So the typical use of plot, what you'll mostly do is you'll feed in matrices and you'll give it X's, uh, if you look in this pop up here, it says plot x1, y1, line spec. Line spec is the specifier, so like the x to make them x's instead of dots, for example. Um, but if I do just the x's and y's, then I can have x1 being 1, 2, 3, those are the x's. And then let's say my y's are 2, 4, and 6. So now I have a line because 1, 2, 3 uh, for x and 2, 4, 6 for y will make a line. And I'll have x1, y2. And then if I hover close to it, you'll see it'll pop up that little gray circle and it will show me an x and y value. But it plotted that point, right? And it just plotted a blue line in between. So that's the default. It will plot points and it'll just plot. Um, tiny dots so you can't really see them, but the lines you can automatically see, right? Now I can look at this third point, x of 3, y of 6. 
So that's how you can do x values and y values. So let's say we had a bunch of values or a bunch of points. And I want to plot points 1, 2, 7, 11, uh, 5, 10, and 11, 16. All I'll do for this then is I'll have my x be 1, 7, 5, 11. And my y's are 2, 11, 10, 16. Uh, plot this, and as you can see, nothing popped up. The reason for this is because it's still got the figure up, it's right here. So when I went through this, it plotted the 1, 2, and then the 7, 11, and then the 5, 10, and then the, it uh, doesn't want to show this point, but the final is 11, 60, right? And, uh, you can see it had a little glitch where it showed the some line artifacts there. But uh, in any case, this is the plot we get, right? And now if I close this, once again, it'll just pop up just like normal. But if you're not seeing it pop up, that's probably why. It's in the background, and you just clicked off. And now it's nowhere to be found, but that's just because it's in another window. So uh, that's how you do plotting with x's and y's. If you feed in only one matrix, it will automatically go as if this is the Y matrix, and then it'll just set a X matrix of one, two, three, four. So if I run this, it says X of one, Y of two, X of two, Y of 11, X of three, Y of 10, X of 16, or X of uh, four, Y of 16, right there. So uh, that's what happens if you feed in only one matrix. So we've looked at uh, mathematical functions, looked at sign in an example. But let's look at some more mathematical functions real quick, and then we'll go back to this plotting to use it as an example of plotting the sign. So in MATLAB, we've seen you can use the trigonometric identities, right? And we can have sine, cosine, tangent, and you can use sine, cos, tan. And as we know, if you use a function, we type in whatever the name of the function is, open parentheses, everything that goes in this function, whatever is input to this function, and then close parentheses, and then this will be output variable, and it's just whatever we name the output of it is whatever is returned by this function. So for sine, sine of x, we already know it takes in radians. So if I do sine of, of uh, 1, sine of radians of 1 is 0.8415. So those are trigonometric identities. What about, we've got sine, cos, and tan. What about some other ones? So. Uh, ABS is a function that returns the absolute value. So if I do ABS of negative 1, it'll just make it a positive, right? Pretty simple. Another one, SQRT. SQRT, you may guess, is square root. So square root of 1, 1, for example, square root of 2 is 1.4142, right? Just as we expect. How about some other ones? EXP is in math that's e to the power of whatever e e to the 10 if i comment this out that's exp of 10 right so 2.2026 times 10 to the 4 that's the result of e to the 10 e just being the natural value the variable we use in math if we did exp of 1 is 2.7183. And if you haven't dealt with E before, it's like pi. It's just a constant you'll, you'll deal with. What other ones do we have? We have log. And log is log of 10 is 2.3026. So if I pull up the documentation for log, log returns the natural logarithm 
ln of x of each element in array x. So you might expect this to be ln of 10, because that's how you typically have seen it in like math. But in programming, typically log is natural log, and log 10 is what you would think of log, and that's log base. Going around that, log base 10 of 10 is 1, just like natural log of e, which we can get with exp of 1, is also 1, right? So that makes sense. Something you do with the math factorials. So factorial of 10 is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Don't really need to do the one, but you can say I get the same answer. So this is a built-in function just to calculate this for us. So we don't have to type it. If we had factorial of 100, it would take really long to type all that out, right? But uh, it can easily calculate it for us in an instant. Primes. What does this do? Well, let's see. It shows the prime values less than or equal to this. So if I do 1150, return a lot of prime values, uh, all less than 1150. And I can pull up the documentation for primes, or I'll just use help primes. So roll vector of the prime numbers less than or equal to n. Is prime is a function that you may or may not have guessed, but if I feed in these primes, 1150, return logical zero. And remember from earlier, logical zero means false. So this is not a prime number. Um, whereas if I go to three, it will return logical one. So this is true. That is a prime number. So this is just check if the input is a prime number. And I can say is three prime in my variable and it says, okay, yeah, it is prime. So what about the next one? Something we use in math. If I use documentation here for factor, factor is another function. And if I do factor of 200, it will use the prime factors of 200. So 200 is two times two times two times five times five. And it just breaks it down into the base uh, prime numbers that compose this. So you can use that interesting tool you'd find some uses for. So factor of 15 would, if I can spell it properly, factor of 15 would be 3 and 5 because 15 is not a prime number and it's composed of the prime numbers 3 and 5. So you can factor it out with factor. Uh, prime numbers multiply to the input. Okay, so that's factor. And let's go into two more for now. GCD, which is short for greatest common denominator. And I'll feed in two values here, 110. And between 110, the greatest common denominator is 10. Right, that makes sense. If I did 135, it would be five, right? And I can pull up the documentation, GCD, greatest common divisor of A and B. Uh, and then it gives you some information here. Elements in G are always non-negative. So the output will not be negative. Um, and GCD of zero, zero. So trying to find the greatest common divisor of zero and zero returns zero. So just some, like I say, you want to use the documentation, it's your friend. Uh, so if you're wondering, will it produce an error if I feed in zero and zero? No, it'll just return zero. Greatest common. And uh, let's see, if I do doc for GCD, LCM, LCM is the function I'm looking for, lowest common multiple. 10 and 100 is 100. So if I did 3, 100, I get 300. 
And if I pull up the doc for LCM, returns the least common multiple of A and B. Then what I would do here is if I wanted to really just see the lowest common multiple for each of these with one, for example, it'll return the matrix same size as the input, and it's got the same values because one is a fairly useless number. But if I did three, then the lowest common multiple between uh, three, 100, 50, 10 with three is three, 300, 150, and 30. So that's how lowest common multiple works. You can also do three sets of values and it just says, if I give it multiple things here, one, two, three, and 5, 11, 10, oops, let's do 5, 11, 15. Now when I run this, it'll just return one thing, 5, 22, and 15, and that's because the lowest common multiple between 1 and 5 is 5, the lowest common multiple between 11 and 2 is 22, the lowest common multiple between 3 and 15 is 15, because 3 is a factor of 15. All right. So those are the main math functions we're going to use. Let's show three more actually real quick. So you have sine, cos, tan. Uh, you also have sine inverse, which you may think of like this. Whoops. Sine inverse of sine of 1. Sine inverse of sine of 1 would return 1, right? But MATLAB doesn't understand this formatting. So what they'd use is the old format of inverse and they call it the arc or the a sine. So the a sine of sine of one would return one. The a cosine of cosine of 11 would return 11. And a tan of tan of zero point that, right, right here. And in this, it will return exactly that. This is how you perform the inverse sine, cosine, and tangent. All right, so let's go back into plotting and do a more interesting plot. So what I'm going to do here is use a few tools we've already used to construct a plot. And what I'll do here is x is a matrix, and I'm just going to go from 0 to 100. And I'm going to go in increments of 0 0.1. Remember, that's how we do that with the colon operator. Uh, y is sine of x. If I run this, oops, let me actually feed in my x and y to the plot. And I pull up my sine. It goes from x is 0 radians to 100 radians. And y is 0 to 1. And it just plots the sinusoidal plot. But let's go, let's go to a lot smaller. Let's go to one. And great tool here is close all. And that way you don't have to keep clicking to open the figure or worry that you forgot. Uh, close all will close any open figures and then just recreate one when you're doing plot. So you can see it goes from zero to one. We go zero, zero. 0 0.1, it's got a point of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, so on all the way to 1. And it just returns the sign of each of those values and then plots a line in between them. So this looks like a pretty smooth curve, but if I did uh, 2 times 3.1415, so it goes from 0 to 2 pi in increments of 0.1, this looks pretty smooth. Right, but if I did bigger increments, if I did 0 0.5, for example, you can see it becomes jagged because all it's doing is plotting a line in between these points. It doesn't understand the curve of sine. It's just plotting. If I look at x, x is 0, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, and y is 0 0.4794, 
so on. Uh, so it's just plotting in that x, first x versus the first y, second x versus the second y, all the way forward. And so to get a smooth curve like this, we want to do really small increments, like a point one here, and now it looks like a smooth curve, just like we probably are hoping out of this. So that's how you can uh, use the built-in functions, for example, to create plots for what you might want uh, by just generating points, create our matrices like we saw before. This is a great example of why you'd want to know how to create a big matrix easily and quickly instead of having to do. I mean, imagine if every time you wanted to do this, you had to do your threes, your fours, your five, all the way uh, to the seven or whatever you wanted to go to. That would be a ginormous pain. So we can just do three point one four. A neat little tool we have as well is we talked about i and j are an imaginary value of one, real value of zero. But there are a few other things here. And the main ones are uh, pi. So 3.1416, that's because I have format short g. But if I do format long, I'm going to pull up pi again, 3.1415926563. 5, 8, 9, 7, 9, 3. So that gives us the value of pi and it goes more digits because it's double it. It uh, carries more information than this. So that's that's one variable. So to type in 3.14, we can just type in pi, pi, and it calculates it for us. Very nice. So that's i, j, pi, um, inf, i and f for infinity another one you've seen and nan is one more that uh, nan is for not a number and the utility of nan is if you have x is 0 1 2 3 so i'll go 0 point 3 right to make that if my y is 1 2 3 infinity and i try and plot this question is what will it do and what it will do is it will ignore my third x right here because it gives me a value of infinity and if i were to do in the end it will again return nothing because it's just going to ignore it um, often if you want to just have a placeholder uh, you'll go with NAN. INF is mostly just in reference to, okay, this is a number that's like something's been multiplied by double to get it to be so high it's undeal withable. Uh, can't handle it. So like if we do INF times 11, return INF. You do NAN times 11, return NAN. So in many ways they function the same way, but NAN is typically like a placeholder um, and you may see reasons why you'd want like a placeholder because you can't have a blank spot in a matrix or whatever. So those are built in variables. We have I and J, we have pi, we have N, the N and I and F. So these are things that like you don't see in the workspace, but MATLAB has them in the background. Um, and if I was to say i is 1, it will override the value of i with 1, because initially it was an imaginary value of 1, but now it's i equals 1. If you run into this problem, you can clear i. And now, even though it's not in the workspace, it's in MATLAB's background workspace, and it still has that value. So these are some ones you want to avoid. You want to avoid overriding because they're useful. Just pick another variable name. Even if you have to do like i underscore, pick something else so that you're not overriding i, j, pi, n, n, and n. All right, so this is plotting once again. Pull this up, and we can just close all to close the figures. But the way this is handling it is if I type figure, what it's doing is it creates a figure immediately where I type figure. So figure right here. Figure two right here. So created a figure, 
and then I didn't do anything with it. So it just created a blank one, and then moved right to figure two, because I created another figure, and then it plotted right there. So if I had a plot of 0, 0 0.1, 1, and then sine of that same thing, and I run this, it will create a new figure, because last time we were on figure two, so create a new figure, figure three, that's the lines in between uh, each of these points for the X and Y, and then create a new figure four, that's for the X and Y here. So that's why I like to do the close all, because it just closes everything open, and now I'm starting, okay, right here I got figure two, right here I got figure one, and I know what's on each of them. You can also do figure one, figure two, and let's see, you got to do this actually. Figure one, figure five. And now I have figure one here that I'm working with and figure five that I'm working with. So you can use figure if you just wanted to create a new figure, figure one if you want to deal with one. So let's say I want to work on figure one later again, I'll call it figure one and then do whatever I'm trying to do with that. That's the advantage of doing one specifically. Uh, and just as with figure, you can do that. You can also do close of just one. I can close one. Go here, close F1. So in that case, you have to say F1 equals figure. So if I were to do that, I would have to specify A is that figure, and then close A. So typically, I just deal with close all. So yeah, this is how we can create plots and have a little bit of control over them, make multiple plots, things like that. And let's look at a few more things. So we've got plot, we got figure. Um, two more functions that we'll deal with here is X label and Y label. So X label takes in a name for the X axis. So I'll just feed in a string here and I'll say this is the X axis and Y label. And I always do this. So fix it here, EL, this is the Y axis. So now if I pull this up. We got no labels on X and Y for the first figure because we didn't make any. But for the second figure, after plotting it, we specified X label, this is the x-axis, that's what it says on x, and y label, this is the y-axis, that's what it says on y. So typically what you really want here is, for the x-label, we have theta in radians, for example, and we have sine of theta on the y. So we can run this, and this is probably what we want, theta in radians for the x. So we've got the variable and the units and the variable on the y. So a cool little thing here is if you put a forward slash, we can actually make it be the actual symbol theta right there on the plot. So that's kind of cool. Um, and typically use brackets or parentheses for the units. So sine of theta, and then this is theta radians. So uh, these are very important, a way to sh show information. If I just show you this plot, I'm looking at this, I have no idea what is X, what is Y. I've, I can't tell this is a sign. Even if I could, what is it supposed to tell me, right? Whereas this tells me, okay, theta in radians, oops, got a little glitch there. Uh, theta in radians, sine of theta, that tells me what I've got on each of these axes. So very important to have that, otherwise nobody can figure out what is on your figure. So another function here is title, and you again feed in a string to your title, and that's just going to be, this is a plot of sine of theta. 
right? And it'll just make big, bold title up here. This is a plot of sine of theta. These three you want to include on like every plot so that people can understand what in the world is going on with your plot. Now, one more thing real quick is, so let's say we want to put these on the same plot. What I can do is I can first plot this. It's my x comma y, and then I can give it another x and y right here. So on this figure, I'll plot both of these plots together. So when I run this, first one is fine. And I don't want this. I'm running again to get no errors. Uh, I've got the two plots here. You can see they're different colors, but I can't super tell which one is which. I know I have two plots, one with x and y of this, and one with x and y of this. And I've got a X label, and I've got a Y label, which you can actually just click and uh, type to change it. So if I put a two there, make it a two, you can remove it. So that's a nice tool. And you can also click to show points. Nice tool again, and just drag around. You can edit that to make it a three or Y three can totally mess somebody up trying to understand this plot and call them both x i can do whatever i want but uh anyway back to this plot i don't know which lines are which so there's a function for this and this is legend just like a legend for a map and you'll give a description for the first set of x and y's and then a description for the second set of x and y's so with plot you're just able to give x1 y1 x2, y2, x3, y3, going on for however many x's and y's you want to include. When you plot one after another, it will override, so it re will really just show this final plotting. A way that you can deal with this is you can do a hold. And if I do hold on, then it will, if I do a hold on, it will, uh, after the hold on, keep everything plotted on the, on the figure. So once again, if I just plot multiple times, it'll override it. It'll just, just show the last plot. Um, if I do a hold on, then it'll show all of them, or I can combine them all into one plot. And in either case, uh, the order that they're written on the figure because this would be overridden by this. So let's just look at this one. Uh, so on this figure, we have two, two plots of lines, right? Those orange and the red. And the orange is my first, and the second is sine of theta, right? So when I run this, it pulls up and then it now has a legend saying, okay, blue, this is my first, I just labeled it my first, you can call it whatever you want, but that's just to give me the information. Okay, this is my first plot, and then orange, the sine of theta, that's my second plot. And then the final thing we'll look into here is axis. And axis takes in the limits for what you want this to be. So right here, you'll give it an x minimum, x maximum y minimum and y maximum and if i run this you can see x goes from negative one to one y goes from zero to 100 and it totally skews where i'm at in this plot right because it's now not going uh when you don't give it axis that level automatically pick something that will pretty well fit the points so you only want this if you want to have control over exactly what your x's and y's are and once again, it just picks the minimum. So to recreate this, I would do axis 0, 2, 0, 3. And now if I run it, it will look like it did nothing because it will indeed run from 0 to 2, 0 to 3. But I could easily swap. Uh, instead of it going from 0 to 2, I can do negative 0.1 and 2.1. Let's say I really want to see past this edge. I can do that real quick very easily.
So just a refresher, we've got uh, the variable declarations, right? These are our classes. It's going to do the pop down and then choose the columns you want to see. You can see the value in class. Um, if you were to look at bytes size, I can scroll here. Bytes is the amount of space it's taking up. It's taking up 32 bytes, not bits. This is actually a different thing. We won't go into the details, but that's how much storage is taking up in the program. 32 bytes divided you int 8 of 11. It's only one byte. So that's why you, this is 32 times as much information that it's taking up as this is. And you can see in 64 is eight bytes. So you can see how much information it, this is taking up, but typically we'll just care about the class and the value. But these are how you create values. We got numbers, we got double. That's the main thing we're gonna be dealing with. And then signed and unsigned integers, how base 10 versus base two works. We got strings and characters. This is a string. These are characters. And we got true, false, and we got imaginary and complex. All right? That's what we were talking about. Complex. Remember how to deal with uh, adding strings, how different operations perform with each other, how to convert them into one another. Imaginary numbers, pi, not a number, infinity, all constants that uh, you can overwrite in variables, but you don't want to. Then we've got our plotting that we use and mathematical functions where A is inverse and a bunch of functions that we got in MATLAB. And if we want to find some more, I can just pull up the documentation. Again, explore MATLAB, and I can say, okay, mathematics. I want to do elementary math, exponents, and logarithms. So go ahead and look in more in the documentation, see the different mathematical functions and stuff. And thanks for watching.